So thank you all for showing up. Um, I want to discuss two related topics today. Uh, hey, Dana. One is um, it's sort of a uh, socio-historical topic, and that is, uh, as we know, well, well, what is the relationship between, let's say, a traditional Orthodox religious organization and then, let's say, a progressive wing of it? There's Brahmatirtha, head of the Bhaktivedanta Institute. So specifically, of course, in ISKCON, there is a what you could call a traditional Hare Krishna movement that has temples, uh, people dress in a certain way, and they follow certain rules. And then we have Krishna West, which is part of ISKCON. And so ultimately, I think this is an interesting sociological issue in, in terms of... Um, and we find this even in... Uh, in uh, books by great teachers like Rupa Goswami. He's one of the most prominent teachers of Krishna consciousness. And he lived in the 1500s, <clears throat> basically. So about 500 years ago. And uh, he wrote a book called the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which Prabhupada translated uh, with the title Nectar Devotion, in which he, uh, so in chapter six of that book, Rupa Goswami explains that there are two categories of rules. One is um, fundamental rules, rules that we should always follow. and But the other group, is it, he calls it details. In other words, time and place adjustments that you don't have to follow always. It's just something which you adjust according to the circumstances you're in. So, for example, dress, dressing a certain way clearly is not a basic principle, although some people don't know that. Uh, but actually, it's uh, it's a detail. It's, it's just a detail. For example, I got my undergraduate degree at UCLA, and of course, grew up with UCLA basketball, and so, uh, and football. So the, the, the UCLA colors are uh, powder blue and gold. And uh, so that's not like an absolute truth. In other words, they I'm sure they won't, but they someone just happened to choose those colors or it works or and, and so those are things that, that are not eternal truth, they're not absolute truth, they're not required. For example, let's say to go to UCLA and get a degree, you don't have to wear powder blue and gold clothes. But the football team does. And so the topic of uniforms, I, I think, is a very interesting topic because it's it's a uh, it's a sociological topic. It's not a theological topic. I mean, wearing a uniform or not wearing a uniform doesn't make you more or less religious. Uh, although, although for some people it may help them. For example, when I was a kid, I was also a baseball fan, and I remember that uh, it was like a common thing where some young player would would be uh would be signed to play for the New York Yankees. And of course the New York Yankees, the baseball team, it was this um legendary team. And there were many stories where a player would say, when I put on the pinstripes, the Yankee uniform, it was like a change of consciousness. It was like a really thrilling moment. So um so the topic of uniforms, uh on the one hand because as we know in the Hare Krishna movement, people wear, at least in the conservative movement or traditional, they wear unmistakable uniforms. You could never think they were somebody else. And so um, so that's not a theological requirement. In other words, in order to practice spiritual life, in order to become Krishna conscious, you obviously don't have to dress like that. And so, in fact, many people have realized that and there's sort of been a reaction against the whole idea of wearing any kind of uniform, that somehow it's an infringement upon individual freedom, or it's um, it makes us look a little, I don't know, cultish or foolish to the general public if everybody's dressed the same way. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear fine. Okay. Chicago, so... Um, I would like to not play the devil's advocate, 
But um, because in Krishna West, of course, we don't have uniforms. And uh, but th but that raised the larger. That's actually I didn't want to just talk about dress. I actually wanted to raise the, the raise a larger topic. And the larger topic is if there is a spiritual movement that does things in a certain way, but doesn't require all those behaviors. For example, in ISKCON, a person is not required to wear Indian clothes or robes or whatever. So it's not a requirement. And uh, or for example, they typically in a, in a Hare Krishna temple, they have what we call deities, sort of these uh, you know, visible forms, which are typical actually of uh, of a Euro Euro Indian culture. Uh, Indo-European, they usually say Indo-European. So, so in Krishna West, where we are trying to practice bhakti yoga, and we're trying to do it in a way that's appealing to Western people, or at least tolerable <laughs> to Western people, we're in the sense that people can identify with, people could say, okay, I could do that. That could be me. I could live in that way. And so wearing exotic clothes is something that... Uh, for most people, they kind of check out on that one because most people don't want to walk around wearing very exotic clothes and call that kind of attention to themselves. And so, but the, again, this raises a general topic, which I find interesting just as a socio-historical topic. And that is, if you look at the conservative Hare Krishna movement, uh, what is there in that movement that should be retained and what is there that's just superfluous? That's, you could say, counterproductive in trying to reach Western people, not spiritually necessary, and therefore something which should not be used, something that should be discarded. And so I guess my, my proposition here, my, my thinking on this would be that it does require some thought. It does require some thought. It's, um, for example we could throw out something that really is a uh, an important component of a powerful spiritual life. Now, just to give one example of that, of, a, of, of something which is, uh, which is generally necessary, but then you could say specifically, how would you apply that, let's say in Krishna West? Um, According to our philosophy, and I think according to common sense as well, uh, the biggest problem we have in our in, in our present incarnation in the material world, the biggest problem we have is that we have exaggerated ego. And by that, I don't mean someone who's just uh, goes around showing off or bragging about themselves. I mean, let's say even a normal person a normal person who's not a, a narcissist or who's not a person, let's say, who is vain, is full of vanity or very proud and, you know, will never admit they're wrong or always wants to get the last word in. I, I'm not talking about sort of, you know, those kinds of cases where someone is just obnoxiously self-centered. But, but if we talk about just normal people, people that are not generally considered to be egotistical or narcissistic, but they're just kind of reasonably, what would you say, modest people. Um, but there's something about material life itself, which is, how would you say, um, infected with a certain kind of artificial pride or vanity. And uh, this gets, now we have to get into theology. Uh, and that is the understanding that we are eternal souls in material bodies. And, and of course, we take on a certain identity, uh, a national identity, a racial identity, and a certain age, a gender uh, even a regional identity. And so we we are eternal souls that have taken on 
what what are called in Sanskrit upadis or designations so that we identify with. And and I mean, think of the word identify, the verb identify, which is a very common verb. Of course, it's even used now kind of informally, like, yeah, I can identify with that. So, so what does that verb really mean? I mean, clearly it comes from the word identity. So to identify with something means that somehow you take it on as part of your identity of who you think you are. And, and although we use the term very loosely, like I can identify with, or I can't identify with that. Um, if you think about it, uh, including something, importing something into your life so that it becomes part of who you are. It's a very serious thing. We use that verb to identify with kind of loosely, but actually it's it's a it's a really significant thing to do to identify to to to, to in, assimilate something as part of who you think you are. And so, of course, the uh, the the most prominent case of this is where we we do the mirror mirror on the wall thing where we we accept the body we accept the body we are presently inhabiting as ourself which is of course a mistake i mean the bhagavad gita gives a very simple proof logical proof i mean it has implicit premises but basically it's a logical proof that that we are not the body that we could not be the body and that is Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, um, Dehi Nosmin Jita Dehi Komarang Jovanam Jara, and so on, that uh, the soul embodied, the soul inside a body passes through a Komaram, which means childhood, Jovana, youth, and then Jara, old age. Uh, by the way, the Sanskrit word Jara, old age, is where we get words like geriatric and uh, gerontology and so on. So anyway, um, and yet at the same time, as Descartes pointed out, uh, all of us have a continuing sense of personal identity. In other words, we commonly say, and in this case, you know, it's one of those cases where if you examine the language people use, you can understand what their understanding is of something. And so people commonly say, I was a child or I was born. For example, I was born in Los Angeles and I have the great distinction of having been born in a hospital, which was converted into a Scientology center. But anyway, I won't get into that now. So, um, but I was born in Los Angeles. So I remember, I remember being a young child and I would say, okay, I, you know, I lived in uh, sort of West LA, I won't go into the you know, all the geography of Los Angeles, but I lived in West LA, just about maybe like a mile or two east of Venice and uh, I, I up to the age of eight and a half. And so when I think back to my childhood, I remember I was playing and going to school and so on. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that was me. That was definitely me that lived on Berryman Avenue, uh, you know, in sort of the in, in western, western part of LA. And so... But that body's gone. I mean, the body I had when I was a kid on Berryman Avenue, uh, that body didn't just stretch into my adult body. It, uh, it's actually gone. Like, for example, every two weeks, uh, you, you, you change your skin. You're in a new skin. I know that because when I was at Harvard, I, uh, I, I had this really brilliant idea, which was to take care of a garden, pull out all kinds of, I didn't know that the garden was basically a, a poison oak garden. So anyway, I got this really bad, you know, horrible, itchy poison oak. And it, it, it takes two weeks because you literally have to replace the skin because poison oak or poison ivy, apparently it bonds to your skin. And so you just have to wait till you grow new skin. But in any case, so, the skin, the different parts of the body. So we've already reincarnated. If you divide your age by seven, that's how many times you've already reincarnated in this life. So, so people say, do you believe in reincarnation? Yeah, if you're if you're scientific. 
I mean, if if you're sci if you take science seriously, there's no there's no option. There's no other option. There is reincarnation because we do it every seven years. And so even though our body's different, we're the same person. At, at the deepest level, no matter how many times or in whatever ways you changed your mind or your attitude or whatever, it's still you. Like, for example, I can say that when I was a young student at Berkeley, I was like insufferably self-righteous about my political views. In fact, I've read some of my old essays my mother kept, and it's needless to say, it's extremely embarrassing. It's often extremely embarrassing to read the self-righteous papers you wrote when you were an undergraduate, especially if you were in Berkeley in the late 60s. Uh, anyway, so, you know, we've changed our minds, we've changed our bodies, but it's still us. So you, so if you want to be the body, you're out of luck because you can't be. It's just logically impossible. So we are souls, but we take on this bodily identity that we think, you know, we're Americans or we're Bulgarians. You know, honk if you love Bulgaria. So actually, there's some very nice people in Bulgaria that do Christian West. We have Krishna West fans in Bulgaria. So, um, so then, of course, the bodily identification becomes the basis of further embellishments. Like, for example, I'm not only my body, I'm, I'm an, I have an American body or a male body or female, or I'm a certain age or whatever. It just goes on and on and on. Or I'm a musician or I'm a brilliant engineer, whatever. So we just sort of multiply this false ego. So getting back to the point of identifying with something, the whole problem uh, our whole, I mean, basically, the entire problem of material life is this false identification. So if we can transfer our identification to the soul, which is what we really are, then, uh, you know, you, it's, it's a brand new ball game, as they say. And so, so what's stopping us from just switching? If by just giving up bodily identities and identifying ourselves as eternal souls, I mean, it's really in our self-interest to be eternal. It's like massively in our self-interest to be eternal and not mortal. So um, why don't we just do that? And the reason we don't just do that is because we have to give something up, namely pride. Because when we identify the body with a certain nation or gender, this it, it's not just it's not just a, um, how should I say, a neutral psychological act. We actually develop pride. We become self-centered. We identify with things, but, but ultimately, apart from what we are in society, like our vocation, age, or, you know, how, however the world looks at us, and however we look at ourselves through the eyes of the world, um, there's a certain pride. There's a certain apart from that social consciousness or socially constructed identities, which of course nationalism and whatever, if you, you know, if you're a doctor or if you're, a, you know, I don't know, a table tennis champion, whatever you are. Yeah. I mean, those are kind of socially constructed identities, but there's one identity, which is really very individualistic. And that is just thinking I'm the center of reality. And that's something that everyone does more or less. Like I'm the center of my own life. So reality as I perceive it, I mean, if I was, let's say I had to answer a question to save my life, and the question was, are you the center of the universe? I'd say no, because my rational intelligence would tell me I'm not the center. But in our daily life, in our daily emotional existence, we live and feel and think as if we are the center of everything. Everyone is, in this world, more or less self-centered. So now getting back to uniforms, you see, I didn't forget. You may think, yeah, it's probably age related. No, I actually remember. So um, getting back to the uniforms, in a sense, well, in, in, a, in a major sense, what we're trying to do in bhakti yoga is sort of dissolve that false ego, that sense of self-centeredness, because the price we pay for being self-centered is that uh, we can't see God. And if we can't see God, we can't see ourselves because we're part of God. 
and we have to endure this really obnoxious thing called birth and death. Uh, because we're eternal. We're actually eternal. And so it's really, it's really like re absurd to die or to think you're dying when actually you're eternal. It's kind of childish. It's like children, you know, you know, child is sleeping in bed. I remember when I was a, actually, unless you remember the 50s, you may not remember this. If you weren't alive in the 50s, you probably don't remember them. But um, it was like a real, I don't want to say fad, it was like a fashion that men on their desks, like in their offices, would have these black ceramic, these black panthers. Any Anyone ever seen those? Remember those? Yeah. If you have white hair or gray hair, you're nodding right now. Okay, so um, my father had one on his desk. It was, it was just like it was very, very common back then. It was kind of like a Black Panther kind of on the prowl. And uh, so one time, I must have been like about four years old or something, I kind of had I, I, three or four, you know, a certain age where, you know, your mind can, you really can't distinguish so well between what your mind is telling you what's really out there in front of you. And and I, I thought I saw a Black Panther, you know, crawling across the wall of my room or something. I think I went and got my parents. So um so but that was an irrational fear. That was a fear based on an illusion. So in the same way, the fear of dying is an illusion. It's an illusion. It's, it's based just on a misperception. So, but if if you don't accept who you really are, which is an eternal soul, then you make up you make up a fictitious identity based on your body. You take the body to be the self. So again, but we take on this fictitious bodily identity precisely because we can be the center of that uh, virtual illusory world in in the world that we create in our mind which is not the real world uh we get to be the center of it and so the price you pay to give up the fantasy world we're living in right now in which we are our bodies and we're the you know everyone is self-centered the price you pay is that you can't be the center god is the center and it's uh you know some people just don't want to pay that price Therefore, I say there's like philosophical atheism, but there's always there all, there's also psychological atheism. Uh, in, in the sense that you may intellectually or philosophically say I believe in God, but you or I, you know, say you know we may live in a world in which we're just self-centered, and and we see everything kind of through that self-centered lens, and so it's psychologically we don't really accept God, although philosophically we do. And so if you're practicing spiritual life, it's not enough to just sort of affirm a credo. If you're practicing spiritual life, you actually have to go through this psychological renovation, which is called spiritual practice. And that's what it really is. That's what's just like we chant Hare Krishna. Why? Because most people like to hear their, their own name chanted. And so chanting God's name instead of your name, or even if you sing some popular song where vicariously, you know, you're the prettiest girl at the dance or, or the, you know, the, the best guy there or something. And so that's why we listen to popular music. That's why we go to movies, because vicariously we fantasize about being something we can't really be in our actual life because, you know, because of the reality of the bodies we have. So... So that's what spiritual life is. It's it's a question of kind of dissolving or just getting rid of this false ego, which is separating us from reality and real happiness and eternal life. And so if you look at the practice of bhakti yoga, a lot of the things we practice are meant to tamp down, get rid of that false uh, ego. So, for example, in India, not only India, Asia, actually, it seems that there's this great divide. I've said this many times between East and West, which goes back to the earliest recorded uh, encounters between East and West. The earliest documented encounters 
between East and West are the great wars between Greece and um, the Persian Empire. And, uh, and, and and which is about, you know, maybe 2,500 years ago. In fact, they made a movie about it. Uh, Brad Pitt, I think it was, played, what was it? 600, 500, 200. I can't remember the number. But anyway, Brad Pitt was leading that number of people against the Persians. So 300. 300. Okay. The winning number is 300. So um, interestingly, the Greeks thought that the Persians were kind of, or the people, Asians in general, were kind of obsequious, always like bowing and scraping before their leaders. They lacked, you know, sort of personal dignity and everything. And the Persians thought the Greeks were just like these obnoxious, egotistical, overinflated individualists. And uh, so, so those mutual attitudes go way back. The mutual attitudes go way back. It's, it's not something new. And so here we are practicing an Eastern tradition, but we have Western bodies and Western attitudes. And so, for example, in, in, in let's say, a, just a regular conservative Hare Krishna temple, they just, um, actually in Sanskrit, you could say Purna Varaha, which means whole hog. You know, they just, uh, they just really get into it. It's a Sanskrit joke. I mean, private Sanskrit joke. So they just really get into it. And of course, they bow down on the floor and sometimes throw their whole body on the floor and they eat the remnants of saintly people and they worship in different ways and so on. And so then, in, in a sense, the challenge to Krishna West, and it is a challenge, it's not automatic. How do we, let's say, adjust, not do things which in the West are perceived as being kind of outlandishly you know, submissive or just, and, and you know, worshiping other people or eating the, the remnants of their food or, or throwing yourself, you know, on the floor, bowing down and so on. Things which are a little exotic for the West. So how do you, how do you, let's say, adjust those things, but at the same time, preserve a, 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 a potent practice of diminishing the false ego. Of course, to be fair, a lot of people have thrown themselves bodily on the ground, offering obeisances, but didn't become humble at all. There's kind of like this little trick of illusion where you become very proud of how unproud you are. So, and, you know, we've seen a lot of people fall victim to that, get faked up. But still, I mean, that there is something about let's say the practice of bowing down and, or for example, offering a certain respect to senior practitioners, which is meant, I mean, ultimately it's not an absolute rule. It's a technique. And of course, techniques may vary. So that's really, that's really a question for Krishna West, which I think we should ask ourselves because we should be intelligent and analytical and we should understand practical sociology and psychology. So how do we how do we preserve those benefits of it? just like in, in certain, some certain forms of Buddhism? Like in Japan, they have these monasteries where the Buddhist leader has a stick and sort of beats the uh, acolytes. And uh, something which never really appealed to me, I, I never really got the, uh, the, never felt an impulse to fly to Japan so I can enroll somewhere and be beaten by the head of a Buddhist monastery. But, so that's kind of like a, I mean, what for me is a somewhat bizarre way to sort of train people to be humble. So, but how do we do it? I mean, how do we do it? And, or do we do it? Or, I mean, do we do it? Anyway, get, we'll get into the phonetics. So, so how in Krishna West do we systematically practice pushing down or just getting rid of the false ego and learning to be not like, I mean, just learning to be humble. Learning to be humble, not, not in a way which is like sort of inappropriate or where you have low self-esteem. We're not talking about low self-esteem here at all. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about uh, 
We're talking about actual humility, which is not uh, not just being servile or a psychophant or groveling. There's all these great synonyms, actually. We're not talking about that. I mean, if you look up, let's say, I'm going to read the word humble in the dictionary and hope that this often mediocre dictionary actually comes through for me. So uh, humble can mean having or showing a modest estimate of one's value or importance, not arrogant or self-important. And so the word, of course, gives you a synonym, modest, unassuming or moderate in the estimation of... In other words, here's how you can be humble but not have low self-esteem. If... Um, if I think, for example, who am I? I'm just a tiny soul and I'm not that important. But, however, I'm confident that despite whatever disqualifications I have, Krishna has accepted me. And therefore, I believe I can do amazing things because God is helping me. So in that sense, you can have a lot of confidence. And also, if you... If you see yourself through God's eyes, then however kind of unqualified we are, somehow, you know those bumper stickers, God loves you, everyone else thinks you're a, you know, blank, blank, blank. But um, but let's say the the, the fact that that God uh that God does love us um means that we have to love ourselves. Because ultimately, he's smarter than we are. And so if you think that God loves us despite our disqualifications, then and you, and you see yourself through God's eyes, then you can be confident. You can be really happy with your life. You can believe in yourself without actually being obnoxiously proud or vain. And so it really is sort of like a psychological science. It's a, it's, it's a spiritual psychological science. And that's why the practice of bhakti yoga, it may seem simple, like, you know, everybody clap your hands, you know, and chant Hare Krishna. But actually, when you get into the real practice of it, uh, it, it requires serious intelligence. I mean, bhakti yoga is, re is really for people who are thoughtful, who are introspective, who are really honest with themselves. So it's not just, you know, dancing around and then having a big feast and then taking the rest of the week to recover from the big feast. It's, you know, bhakti yoga really requires, I guess when you're young, it doesn't take the rest of the week to recover. At my age, it definitely takes the rest of the week. So so that's Krishna consciousness. So a lot of the things they do in sort of traditional Hare Krishna temples, like bowing down and um, even like men shaving their head or whatever, uh, it's ultimately not some kind of eternal sacred thing. It's just a practical strategy to cultivate humility in our relationship with God. Because if we're not humble, we're not going to get to first base. If we're not humble with God, then, you know, we're just going to... It's like, let's say, for example, someone is like really drunk and obnoxious and they knock on the door of some party and they want to come in and it's a party where people are not drunk and obnoxious. You know, they may say, come back when you're sober. So if we knock on heaven's door, as they say, and... Um, and we're still kind of drunk with false ego and obnoxious, they're going to say, you know, come back when you're sober. And sober means when you practice bhakti yoga enough to kind of not be obnoxious. And so um, so that's real challenge. And, and I think I'll leave it to our stalwart Krishna West devotees. I think this should be a topic of discussion. Are we cultivating humility? Because, for example, take me. Uh, Please take me home with you. I'm just kidding. Like, like for example, <laughs> would you take this guru home with you? No, I don't think so. So, um, you know, I mean, I've been a, <laughs> I've been a 
Sorry, I can't help laughing at my own jokes. Anyway, so when I was when I was a young devotee, um, what was I going about to say? Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I, I became a leader very young. For one thing, because the movement was so young, like if you could sort of, you know, I don't know, if you could chant Hare Krishna at the same time, chew gum or something, he became a leader. I mean, the beginning of the movement, there were there were very, very few devotees. So if you had any kind of ability, you know, you would you would definitely uh, be on the fast track to a leadership position in the Hare Krishna movement because there are so few of us. And and so, and I, you know, I had some Krishna, some God-given ability. So, uh, I mean, by the time I was in the movement one year, and I was 22 years old, I was the vice president of the biggest temple in the world, which at that time was Boston because they were printing Prabhupada's books there and had a lot of people associated with that. And then I became a temple president, actually of Gainesville, Florida, where I am right now. I was the first president of Gainesville, the, the University of Florida, is uh, when I was um, the tender age of, uh, I guess, 21 and a half. No, no, I was much older than I was 22. So, um, and then when I was... And then I became president of Houston. And then when I had been when I was 23 years old, in other words, years away from a fully functioning frontal cortex, when I was 23 years old, I became a um sannyasi. Kind of God on earth. You know, I became a sannyasi, renounced, and I traveled around and was uh I, hey Daya. You have a guest from North Carolina, Daya. So I mean, then I um and once I took sannyas, never again had to pay for lunch. So that was a great deal. But what I mean to say is I was, um, because I was advancing, then I was 24 years old, or 25. When I was 25, Prabhupada gave me this humble service of taking charge of about 20 countries. I, I was I was put in charge of Latin America when I was 25. Um, still not a mature frontal cortex. But anyway... So then when I was 29, I, I became a guru. And um, so the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, here on the one hand, I was I dedicated my life to cultivating humility. And yet my service was to be a leader, to tell other people what to do, to accept praise, to accept, you know, all kinds of stuff, especially when you're a guru or sannyasi. And so these things were kind of going at cross currents. And a lot of people who held these positions didn't really make it. They didn't survive the adulation. So, um, and of course, Krishna, you know, if you're sincere, Krishna will make sure that you get the memo. You know, he'll, uh, he has this really sublime way of beating the crap out of you <laughs> when you're not really doing what you're supposed to be doing. So, um, but the reason I mentioned all this is that, um, in a sense, I really needed to bow down. I really needed, I'm not saying that we're, you know, we're gonna start bowing down like fully, like, you know, stretched out on the floor, but I needed to bow, even if you do it the old European way, you know, you just sort of bow and I guess we won't have the girls curtsy, right? That's no, probably not, unless they're really athletic. But, but the point is, if you're a leader in Krishna consciousness, especially if you're a leader, you really need to take some humble pills, you know, before they don't, before they're shoved down your throat by God. So, because to be a leader in Krishna consciousness means not only to tell other people what to do, but it especially means to set a good example, to show people that I'm practicing Krishna consciousness and somehow it's working. Somehow it's working. And, uh, and so to be humble and at the same time to embrace leadership is, uh, you know, a lot of people don't quite get that in focus. You know, because you have leaders who are just like, almost like, you know, they just, they really want to be humble. And so they become, you know, kind of incompetent and they're, the things they're supposed to be managing become chaotic. 
because they you know they don't really want to tell other people what to do and so uh on the other hand you go to the other extreme you can really get into telling people what to do but then such a person may not really really be authentically uh developing spiritual humility and so that's the real challenge the real challenge is how can you be a leader where inevitably no matter how much you try to do this little corporate game they do you know like the servant leader i mean we are we should be servant leaders that's a great expression we should be servant leaders but you can't just dance around the fact that there are times when someone has to say what's going to be done you know the definition of a camel, right? Uh, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Anyway, that's a joke. So, uh, <laughs> so that's a real challenge in Krishna consciousness. Because even if, let's say, let's say you're not, you don't have some official position in the Hare Krishna movement, but let's say you're just going out and you're sharing Krishna consciousness with other people. And let's say you find someone who's sincere, who's receptive, and they understand that, wow, you've got knowledge. I mean, you really have knowledge. And they and they they actually want to listen to you. And uh, and so you're you're a leader. You, you bump into someone at the, you know, checkout checkout line at Trader Joe's or something that's just sort of interested, or you meet someone anywhere and and, and then you're a leader. Then you're a leader. Actually, one person who uh, approached a devotee, bought a Bhagavad Gita, and then literally dragged the devotee back to his car, he made him sit down in his car because he wanted to hear more about Krishna, who unfortunately now is, of course, uh, not well. And that was Bruce Willis, you know, the actor. Interesting story. So, and he said that when he made the movie The Sixth Sense, it kind of got him interested in these things. But in any case, um, so that's what we have to do. I think the leaders of Krishna West have to have really do like a scan of the way, let's say, traditional with the traditional practice of Krishna conscious consciousness and say, you know, what what should be preserved, what is not necessary, what should be adapted. Like for an example of an adaptation is then the temples that you know they do this full obeisance, this full bowing on the ground. In Krishna West, we don't do that because it's, I don't think you can really sell that. That's not going to be a big seller in the Western world. Although it is in the Old Testament, by the way. It's actually in the Old, it's in the Old Testament all over the place. People bowing down the way, you know, the way they do in Hare Krishna temples. But we can bow the way they used to do in Europe. You know, just like, you know, you can show respect. You don't have to get down on the ground. But, and so that's something that needs to be discussed. How do we preserve the, the benefits of certain, and, and the reason these things are traditional practices, I mean, for two reasons. One thing, they do it that way because it comes from India. But another reason is it's not, it can't be wholly explained by saying it comes from India. It's that it has a practical function, an important practical function. The Indians just kind of did that function their way. It's just like, let's say in India, if they build an office building, uh, there's the engineering, which is not Indian. It's just it's just engineering. But on the other hand, the superstructure, the actual architectural design is going to reflect Indian culture. So spiritual practices are like that. Uh, uh, let me just one second. So it's like that, say bowing down or certain customs or the way you treat senior people. We have we have to be intelligent enough to separate, let's say, the actual psychological engineering of it from just the, you know, the facade. Like, okay, because it's India, this is how they do it. In India, they bow down on the on the ground. That's what India is. However, the active ingredient is not physiological bowing down on the ground. The active ingredient is the idea of somehow engaging your body in submission. Because if you just engage your mind in, in, in let's say, trying to submit to God mentally, 
but your body, you know, kind of has a life of its own. And so therefore, engaging your whole present existence, your mind, your body, just engaging the whole thing in submitting to God is powerful. It's very powerful. It's a great idea. But then we have to figure out how can you do that? How can you engage your whole body and mind, not just your mind, in submission to God in a way that is acceptable and appropriate in the Western world? And if you go down the list of, let's say, things they may, they do in, say, Orthodox Hare Krishna temples that need to be adjusted for a Western audience, but you can't, you have to, just like, for example, I like chewable vitamins. I just, if someone says I got to take a vitamin, I want a nice, tasty, chewable vitamin because then I'll never forget to take it. So if I like the taste, I'll never forget to take my daily vitamin. And some people like capsules for reasons beyond my imagination. So, but so, but it's all, but the point is you, you have to get the vitamin in your system if you need the vitamin. So how do we get that vitamin? How do we get the active ingredient, which was sort of externalized in India, but we still need, but maybe we're going to externalize it, engage our bodies in a somewhat different way. Or for example, in India, when they see a sannyasi, a renounced person, you know, they, they bow, they really, you know, it's a big deal for them. So we can't have, you know, Krishna West devotees throwing themselves on cement sidewalks every time a sannyasi walks by her, you know, because of, <laughs> there used to be a joke, actually. We, there was an old joke in, in ISKCON that, let's say if you were in an airport or shopping mall and let's say like if a sannyasi walked in, so some devotee just bowed down on the ground, you know, it's kind of, and people were staring. And so what you'd say is, uh, yeah, he's looking for his contact lens, you know, it fell out. And that's that was kind of how we would explain it to the general public. And so, but th but that re that requires intelligence, you know. How do you do that? And and the last thing I want to, because I want to end on time at six o'clock, uh, and that is, um, let's say the etiquette towards the guru. For example, in ISKCON, if you write a letter to the guru, they say, "Please accept my humble or my obeisances or humble obeisances." Is kind of uh, sort of nowadays sort of an archaic. English word for uh, like respects or or like submission or whatever. And uh, the Sanskrit word is just namas, like namas, namaste, like in yoga schools. They have all these like fanciful and wonderfully non-literal translations of namaste in yoga schools, like, like the divine in me bows to the divine in you. The reason they say that, first of all, is because Western people are kind of proud and they would never say, I'm bowing to you. They would never say that. So I'm not going to bow to you, but the divine in me is not going to bow to you, but it may bow to the divine in you. So that way, neither of us are actually involved in this sort of oriental submission. And so, <laughs> but, you know, you, you got to love this stuff. So, um, so namaste is just a bow. It doesn't necessarily mean on the floor. It doesn't, you know, it just means a bow. Namaste, like a bow to you, literally can just mean what they used to do in Europe or what they still do in some some places. In Japan, they still do it. You know, political leaders, they you know they bow, and so on. So in Japan, it's it's still active. Um, so what? It's how do you how do you get the benefits of submitting to someone appropriately submitting? not just giving up your autonomy, not giving up your responsibility for your own life, not turning your brain off, but just intelligently, consciously offering respect to someone who is more spiritually advanced than you and who can help you and, and really bless you. And so, so submitting to a guru doesn't mean you give up responsibility for your life. It doesn't mean you stop thinking. To the opposite, if you really know what it means, it's that you have autonomously, intelligently understood that it's in your rational self-interest to follow this person. So it's not an act of giving up personal responsibility. 
it is an act of personal responsibility. For example, when I was about, oh my God, I must have been about eight and a half years old, maybe. And uh, the, the, the nearest municipal pool, because in those days, you know, not a lot of people had swimming pools in California. So the, the nearest pool where I grew up was uh, at Rancho Park. It's a beautiful park. In fact, probably used to walk there, you know, every other day he'd walk there in the park. So there's a pool. So I, you know, went with my brothers or something. We went swimming one summer and I, I had never taken swimming lessons. I must have been about eight years old. So I just sort of, without thinking, I kind of drifted into the deeper water. I was, I was like, you know, my feet didn't touch the bottom. And so I just kind of panicked. I was just eight years old and sort of thrashing around. So one of the lifeguards, you know, it was just some teenager, had a summer job. You know, he jumped into the water and he grabbed me. And I was so panicked. I was just thrashing around. And I'll never forget that he said to me, the lifeguard said to me, Hey, will you just calm down? Otherwise, we're both gonna drown. Because <laughs> I was just like, like that. And so, and so there are times and places and circumstances where you really need to just submit. Not blindly. There is no blind submission in the process of bhakti yoga. You always know what you're doing. The submission is always measured and appropriate, uh, but it is submission. And so one extreme would be blind submission, which is like stupid, because if you're going to blindly submit yourself, you may submit to the wrong person, or you may get a guru that's kind of a, uh, to use an archaic expression, a mixed bag. You know, you, you may get a guru who's, um, you know, who you should follow, but maybe not in everything. Or if you get a guru who's just, you can just follow in everything, that's great. But in any case... Uh, let me just so so submission to a guru is done intelligently, consciously, rationally, but it's done if you find a guru who actually is qualified to teach you. It's like following a piano teacher or following, you know, it's just that's what we do in life. If you find a very qualified teacher, and you just really follow the program, you develop a certain expertise. And the same is true in bhakti yoga. So in the traditional sort of Indian Indian way of submitting, you know, they do certain things. They bow down and they say certain things. We may say all of that is not appropriate, but again, don't throw away the active ingredient. You may not, you know, we may not dress it up in the Indian way, but we need the active ingredient to get the mercy of Krishna. Because Krishna is pleased when he sees us not being, uh, well, to use an old expression, fatuous asses. You know, when Krishna sees us not being vain and not being proud, and because if I'm practicing bhakti yoga, I'm kind of like proud of myself, you know, I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to get there. And so... In fact, because submission is dangerous, because you can submit to the wrong person, or you can, can submit too, too much, or there's a danger of submitting too little and not getting the spiritual benefit. And so the thing about Krishna West is that everything we do, we, we do consciously, intelligently, we know what we're doing, we never give up ourselves, we never just give up responsibility for our own lives, but there are situations where I can see that it is absolutely in my rational self-interest to submit to this person because I see that the instructions I'm getting are appropriate. And if the guru tells you something inappropriate, you know, you need to slam on the brakes. So it's not giving up responsibility for your life. It's just responsibly, consciously following a qualified teacher. But anyway, because we are proud, because we do have the false ego, um, you know, the danger is that we don't submit. I mean, there's a danger of submitting blindly, and there's a danger of not humbling oneself. There's always, you can always go off the road on both sides. And some people, let's say if you're driving, you're so afraid of going off the road on the right, you you, you end up smashing into the, you know, what do they call it thing? Uh, the uh, Between the two lanes. 
My God, I can't believe I forgot that. But you know what I mean. You can go off the road to the left. Hey, there's good hey. old bus. Guardrail? Does that yes. work? Or fighter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's guardrails on both sides. If you only have guardrails on one side, you know, it, it, you may be in danger. So we guard yeah, the median, right? Yeah, we need guardrails on both sides so we don't blindly submit and just, you know, give up responsibility for ourselves. And we don't um, remain too proud to really get the benefit and to really learn, get the blessings of a qualified person. So anyway, those are the points I wanted to make. And so for all of you, we have many Krishna West leaders here. And um, so that's really our challenge. You could say it's an intellectual challenge. It's a philosophical challenge. Don't throw out active ingredients just because they came wrapped up in a type of Indian ethnicity that you're not comfortable with. All those, you know, apparently or outwardly exotic customs, practically all of them have an active medicinal ingredient inside of them. And you have to be intelligent enough to re recognize that and not throw that away. So you get the full potency of bhakti yoga. That was actually, that's actually, I think that's a good idea. So thank you all very much, uh, especially to uh, Jen and Krishnadas, the stalwart pillars of our Chicago program. And also uh, good old Leslie is there. We have, yeah, we have the ambassador from Oregon and good old Dana. <laughs> and also uh, Daya Radhika is there representing North Carolina and Nalini is from Argentina and I don't know all of you unfortunately but uh, Ananda Leela is from Chapel Hill she's beginning her illustrious academic career at the University of North Carolina elite public university and uh, she's the one with the uh, dark glasses and the attitude that was a joke. Just kidding. Just teasing. <laughs> so thank you all very much. It's really, a, it's really, I mean, I feel so fortunate that by all of your hard work and sincerity, that there's, there's something for me to do, try to explain these things. And uh, Jen, my apologies for not being there for the concert, but uh, I owe you one. Okay. So, hope to see you again soon. Hare Krishna. Hi, Bhola Chadaraya. Muchas gracias. Hare Krishna.